So I'm a bit cautious because it's Vikram Seth um, and because he warns us at the end of Flash, one of the poems um, which in a long tradition of thinking critically about the critics murdering, uh, points out bright stream home to bright fish and birds, a gold glow as the gold sun dies. You too, too fast for these poor words float past my eyes. But such drab words, ah, sad to say, when all that's bright has fled and gone. Praise by dull folk dressed all in gray. Live on and on, which is why I'm dressed all today for you <laughs> in gray. Um, um, so what am I to say? Fortune is a great panel which will not be so rendered speechless by a stanza. Um, so let me say this, as Vikram knows, um, uh, we've shared mutual friends for many years who early on warned me when I began to read him with some excitement uh, and immediately wanted to incorporate him and his prose into everything I was writing. They said, you will not anthropologize our friend. Um, and I didn't, with one exception. Um, <laughs> she knows about it. But it's, it's um, so I'm doubly chastened. So I'll just say this, and this comes out of a conversation with Harsha last night as we were walking back from Vikram's talk with Vikram. Um, and um, which is that of all the poems, several of which were quite striking to me, particularly as someone who thinks about age, the whole uh, sextet of, of stages of life. Um, but the poem that is the poem that we kind of read last night, one of the poems we read, which is Host, um, which um, the, he may talk about. So I just want to say this. This is uh, the context is um, in the terms of the poem itself. Can I read this again? Do you mind? I'm sorry, it'll be only a minute. Um, I apologize for reading your prose. Um, it, poetry. <laughs> In the gray suit, it becomes prose. That's not just a slip. It, uh, I heard it was for sale and thought I'd go to see the old house where he lived three years and died. How could I know its stones, its trees, its air, the stream, the small church, the dark rain would say, you've come, you've seen, now stay. A guest I asked, yes, as you are on earth. The means will come, don't fear. What of the risk? Our lives are that from birth. His ghost, his soul is here. He'll change my style. Well, but you could do worse than rent his rooms of verse. Joy came and grief, love came and loss. Three years, tiles down, moles up, drought, flood. Though far in time and faith, I share his tears, his hearth, his ground, his mud. Yet my host stands just out of mind and sight that I may sit and write. So we were talking last night about what some have called your turn to forms that are archaic. You mentioned that in proposing um, the Golden Gate to a gray-suited editor, uh, he immediately turned away aghast when he found that this was to be a novel in verse. So I suppose the, the question I bring again and again that this poem triggered was what it was to inhabit a form, but yet to be allowed a space to write not haunted. Um, there's the point in discussion with the composer, part of the group of people that produce um, uh, these uh, four productions, um, that you allow for uh, the other poet's words to be entered into. Uh, libretto, but not at the end, where there's a way in which um, the, uh, there's a limit to uh, precisely to um, uh, the host uh, coming in, uh, allowing one to sit and write. So I suppose the question is always about your approach to archaic forms and your relationship to the question of, uh, of hospitality, of an ethics of being a guest on earth, as you put it. and. Uh, the, which is something that strikes me, a certain ethic of hospitality across the work, and I find quite magnificent. So I'll leave that for my comments for now. Um, so uh, I think I'm being heard. Let me know if I'm not in the back. Um, I, I want to couch my remarks in terms of three 
um, three problems, which I'm actually going to frame somewhat as questions to you, Vikram, um, that have been raised by my reading and rereading of your work over the last few weeks, and um, especially the attraction that music has exerted in various ways at various moments, and um, with some focus on the rivered earth, the set of four texts for music. Um, so the first issue has to do with the category of public art, um, which seems to me you're entering into with a lot of volition and a lot of generosity by creating these four libretti um, for music festivals. And um, reading, uh, well, as reading those texts and reading about their genesis in the rivered earth, uh, two things came to mind, uh, or two things began to seem very relevant. One of them is an anecdote that I think you relate in one of the introductions to those poems uh, to do with coming upon someone who's reading one of your books and feeling unwelcome and being shooed away, um, which really gets at, as, as in the way you place it in that context, the, the private nature of reading, and especially reading fiction and reading prose. Um, and the passage in A Suitable Boy, which really caught my attention, I think, as it's caught the attention of many other readers, and not only those who are musicians, um, in which Amit Chatterjee says um, the performance of a rug resembles a novel. And the reasons that he gives for that have to do with the possibilities for digression, recombination, freedom, um, and um, in a, a nice sort of layering, which uh, uh, he, um, the, way that he t the way that he puts forward this metaphor is extemporaneously. He's described as extemporizing as he goes along, describing this process of composing. Um, so from my perspective as a historian of music and somebody who focus a lot, focuses a lot on vocal music, especially, um, this seems quite opposite to the kinds of constraints that one is confronted with, welcome constraints often, I think, when um, taking on the project of writing poetry for musical setting. Um, and going back to the explanatory texts in the rivered earth, there are five or 10 or 20 types of constraints that are immediately thrown out very obviously, starting with, um, well, you talked a little bit last night about the back and forth with Alec Roth and the, the need to tailor the texts at times to his preferences and probably at all times to the needs and possibilities of the singers. What can be sung, what can be heard and understood. Um, and then there's the sort of working with festivals and funding. Um, the what is possible um, in terms of forces and performances. It's, um, it seems to me a very generous thing to, um, to enter into that as, as a writer, to sort of make your art public. Um, the, um, and just to give one other example of a kind of constraint, a, a kind of welcome constraint, um, the, the text is for the traveler the third year um, is very interesting, has a very interesting parallel. I don't know whether, um, whether this is intended or whether it's just my fantasy noticing this, but the, um, the segmentation of that hymn from the Rig Veda that's the um, master text for the entire thing um, really reminded me of the way Bach worked with Lutheran chorales, um, taking verses, breaking them up, um, inserting different kinds of elaboration and ornamentation, often holding back the sort of original form and the most clearly communicative and most devotional form um, for the very end of the cantata. Um, so that also seemed to me to be a kind of um, constraint that gives the art over to a very different kind of consumption from what can happen in um, certainly in writing novels and novelistic fiction, but possibly also in writing um, poetry meant for individual reading. Um, second question, uh, I hope this doesn't raise any hackles, but um, the more I read in The Rivered Earth, the more the word tetralogy occurred to me. Um, it's a problematic word for people who um, who are interested in music, and especially 19th century music, because it's perhaps tainted with, by association with Wagner, Wagner's megalomaniac ambitions. Um, there's nothing Wagnerian in a book of these dimensions, <laughs> but, um, but there are certain, there's, well, there's one thing in particular about the project that strikes me as 
having something to do with Gesamtkunstwerk, or at least with a desire to bring the arts together in an interesting way. Um, and I have to say, in a much purer and less um, self-obsessed way than Wagner did. Um, but that has to do with the multiple occasions and the multiple ways in which music and words are woven together um, and made to, uh, made to say the same things in different ways. Specifically, there are a lot of examples, um, and again, I'm getting this partly from the texts themselves and partly from the, uh, well, from listening to some of the music, um, that in purely instrumental music, becomes, is rendered verbal, or is rendered able to communicate verbal ideas um, by uh, especially the, the role of the solo violin in these pieces, and some echoing that goes on between sung lines and then the pieces, um, sometimes the whole independent pieces for solo violin, which are interwoven or interleaved with the songs. Um, there's a very clear example, the um, the final movement of Shared Ground, which is the, um, the one entirely by Roth and, I guess, uh, somewhat by George Herbert, um, the, the melody from the flower, which is wordless but yet has a message attached to it. Um, and then probably the most, the richest one for me, and also the concert that I most would have liked to be at, I think, is the, the fourth year, the, the seven elements. Because of what you say about the programming, um, the, uh, there's a vocal piece, seven elements, a purely instrumental piece, seven elements, and then the rest of the program is made up of Schubert songs. Um, seven Schubert songs loosely attached to seven elements, and, um, and then Schubert's Shepherd on the Rock. Um, song for, well, it used to be for soprano, clarinet, and piano. Uh, this was with violin substituted for the clarinet. Um, that seemed to be an absolute master stroke of programming. But it also raised um, a lot of interesting possibilities for me about intertextual connections between Schubert's melodies and uh, the poetry, usually not very good poetry, that Schubert set. Um, and for example, the, the parallel between your poem, Hermit on the Ice, and Shepherd on the Rock. Um, similar kind of doubling, um, I think, may go on with the various meanings of the trout. And the, the last uh, issue and question that I want to raise has to do with the trout um, and moving from the river to earth for a moment to an equal music. Um, the question would be as simple as why um, make the kind of center, the, the real heart of this novel, Schubert's Trout Quintet? Um, and I've already answered this for myself in one prosaic way, which has to do with um, the fact that the, the musician who's going deaf pretty much has to play the keyboard. Um, you can't be a deaf musician and perform in public on the violin or as a singer. Um, it's probably possible on a piano, but um, so I think if you're going to have a novel about a string quartet and a pianist, the trout quintet is a good place to bring those characters together. But um, in a, in a, on a sort of more subtle level, the Trout Quintet is one of a couple of inst purely instrumental pieces by Schubert, which has a song written into it in much the same way that I was suggesting the Rivered Earth has words written into some of the instrumental passages. Um, so the last movement is a recomposition of a very jaunty, most people think not particularly profound song um, that Schubert composed uh, based on pretty bad poetry um, and a pretty um, heavy-handed metaphor about a trout which is often taken to be a virginal young woman who's being um, captured by a fisherman. And the fisherman, over the course of several stanzas, first can't catch the fish and then figures out tricks to catch the fish. And the final verse, which Schubert actually didn't set in the poem, um, is a warning to other you know, real young girls, not fish, um, to not fall for these kinds of tricks. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things in the novel that suggest that the trout is a significant symbol beyond merely the practical feature of the instrumentation. The London Bait Company, um, the water serpents swimming in the serpentine. Um, I haven't quite managed to put it all together, and I think I'll just I'll, I'll end with one last sort of element to that little cluster, and then just turn, well, uh, seed to the next person and hope that you can answer this question. But, but the trout also comes up in flash 
um, the poem that Lawrence was just reading some of. And um, I think there's, there's all kinds of interesting things about the doubling between that poem and the George Herbert model. Um, but the trout, uh, the second stanza features a, a trout who glints in fin and scale, um, who, with skipping over a bit, with one whisk of your quick tail, flicks past, flick past my eyes. Um, movement, mercurial qualities. Um, I, I would like to hear more about this. I'll stop there. I feel we're giving you about 17 questions. Uh, maybe we should. I can only say that. Maybe, maybe you'd like to respond first of all to those comments before we carry on, or do you want to have all the questions out on the table? I have them all at the same Okay, great, good. Uh, it's going to be a lot of questions, and we'll have to remember what they were. Um, first of all, uh, it's wonderful to have had a chance to revisit these books, some of which I read a long time ago, The Golden Gate in particular, and uh, A Suitable Boy. Um, 1994, I remember, I, uh, when we met in London, when I was giving a concert in London's Woodmore Hall, I was playing a Bach recital, and Vikram turned up at the concert and very kindly came back afterwards. I remember this. And I was so in awe because I had just finished reading this, this, this great big uh, doorstopper of a book. And I remember when I bought it that uh, I was astonished because I read the review. I was living in Paris, and I have the French review here that I see is still there. And it said this book has just appeared, and I bought my copy of it, 1994. This is a 1994 printing of it. First printed, 1994, and the one I bought is 11th Impression, 1994. It had been through a re-impression every month. It's just <laughs> a, extraordinary. Um, so uh, I was already late to the party when I bought my 11th uh, Impression. <laughs> but. Uh, the thing that struck me so forcibly, having read The Golden Gate, uh, which is so full of musical rhythm of all sorts of kinds, um, is to move from that kind of writing into this seemingly completely different kind of writing, where there's all the time and space in the world, although I gather there were there's somewhere 750 pages that were removed from it. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Maybe that's where the rumors come from of a, of a revised edition or a sequel. But uh, I have to say, as I read it, I didn't feel it was a page too long. I got to the end of it and put it down and had this great gap in my life at the end of it that it took a long time to, to fill again because the book had been such a universe that you get into. And what was fascinating about it is that music is, of course, omnipresent in this book as well, even though it's a, a, a huge fresco of, uh, of Indian life at the time. But the, the music in the book struck me very strongly at the time um, in a way that music hadn't in the Golden Gate, where the main musical apparition is a drummer, which I guess is uh, appropriate for uh, a book that's in rhythm like that. Um, and uh, in, in this book, it's completely different because the, most of the music that's present, or a lot of the music that's present, is present through song. So we're often listening to uh, a particular singer, uh, in many circumstances, singing wonderful words by great Urdu poets to the people who are gathered for private concerts, for example. And then what we actually perceive is the effects of music, rather than the music itself very often. And the description of the effects of music on people are extremely powerful. But one of the ways which the book uh, seems to me to be working in a sort of subversive way is that music gets used as a way of describing different people who have different kinds of reactions to the music. And we understand affinities between the listeners. So I kept feeling that music was being used as a trope in the book, in particular for other kinds of relationships and sensitivities. And this brings me to a question which I think other people are going to be raising as well, which is the question of sexuality. Um, that there are ways in, I mean, I always think music and sex are basically the same thing. So uh, the way music works in the book, in particular uh, in some of the relationships which could be defined as sort of crypto-gay relationships, male-male uh, relationships, um, where music is present, and yet it's often in contexts where the people from different communities, one Muslim, one Hindu, for example, um, and the difference and the similarity, the difference that can come together through this unspoken medium of music. And music is extraordinary from that point of view, that it's 
unspoken, uh, which of course is what you then move to with an equal music, which, where there's so much instrumental music, where there are no texts. And then we're back to librettos again, where we have just words that you're responsible for without the, uh, the music. Somebody else is responsible for it. So one of my questions is, how do you find yourself thinking about the difference as a writer between instrumental music and music where words are obviously in the, the primary position? It's uh, partly one of the questions that Marianne was raising as well. And also, uh, how this question of communities and inclusiveness, how music can serve as a, as, a, as a trope, saying something in your novels, beyond just being writing about music, but essentially talking about, I think, desire in many cases. And uh, that this is the, the way we're drawn into the books through the, through the music and the way it expresses relationships between people. Over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. And Vikram, I'm not going to frame this as questions per se, but rather as a personal reflection on um, what your writings have meant for me. Of course, as you all know, Vikram Seth is a writer whose work encompasses several genres of writing and several landscapes of imagination. It's a vast and rich repertoire, and I can't do justice to that repertoire. So instead, I wanted to reflect in my brief comments today on how his work has framed my understandings of what is in fact central to my life as a scholar that is thinking about the urban. And in particular, thinking about the urban condition as a human condition, and thinking about the urban condition as the uniquely intense space and time of post-colonial modernity. And in doing so, I'm going to limit my comments to one text, The Golden Gate, published in 1986. In a book that has shaped quite a bit of urban studies, philosopher Michel de Soto, who has a book called The Practice of Everyday Life, de Soto describes tactics of reading as the practice of improvisation and inhabitation that a reader appropriates a text, remakes its meaning, and thus comes to inhabit it in a way that the author perhaps never intended. A different world, the reader's, writes Dissoto, slips into the author's place. It is this habitable text that is of great interest to me, and it is the trope through which I want to reflect on the Golden Gate. And so let me start with a very personal reflection on how I came to inhabit the Golden Gate. In 1988, I moved from Calcutta, the city of my childhood, to the San Francisco Bay Area, to a small liberal arts women's college, Mills College, where I would earn my undergraduate degree. The move was a rebellion, a rebellion against a system of education in India that I found to be claustrophobic, and severely lacking in critical social thought. It was a rebellion against my wonderful parents who wanted me to attend one of the prestigious East Coast universities in the cities that were familiar to the making of middle-class Bengali futures. <laughs> cities like Boston, and New York, and Philadelphia. San Francisco was distant, unfamiliar, off the map. But I knew San Francisco. I knew it intimately through Vikram Seth's The Golden Gate, which I had come to read over and over again. It became the linchpin of my college essays. It became my justification for a journey as an immigrant from Calcutta to Oakland. And it became, in many ways, a central part of how I came to think as an urbanist. What is it about The Golden Gate that lends itself to such appropriations and habitations? So three points, and these may also speak to the broader repertoire of Vikram Seth's authorship. The Golden Gate, I will submit to you, is an extraordinary narration of the structure of feeling that is urban modernity, of the city itself as a muse. So the blue Pacific, unwrinkled as a pond, defined with wharves and cypresses and pines, three edges of the hieroglyphic of San Francisco, still and square, 
and sun bleached in the ocean air. It is also an extraordinary narration of the habits of loneliness that are an integral part of urban life. A linkless note, no spouse or sibling, no children, John wanders alone into an ice cream parlor, nibbling the edges of a sugar cone by turns, a pair of high school lovers stand giggling. John, uncharmed, discovers his favorite flavors, pumpkin pie and bubble gum, decides to buy a double scoop, sits down, but whether his eyes fall on a knot of three schoolgirls, a clamorous family, or munching cheerfully together, a hippie and a Castro clone, it hurts that only he's alone. No, not T.S. Eliot, Vikram Set. No, not the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, rather the Golden Gate. I know now that what I was reading taught me to think about urban modernity as a paradoxical unity, Marshall Berman's felicitous phrase about Baudelaire's prose poems, about how the modern city is about the wrenching divisions and divides within the modern self itself. Second, I want to submit to you that the Golden Gate is an illumination of what I would call provincial globality. The world depicted in the Golden Gate is a world of global interconnections. Reading it in Calcutta, I was displaced. And it is that displacement that I continue to think about as an important itinerary of knowledge, what Naipaul termed the enigma of arrival. In Seth's extraordinary writings, the Golden Gate is also the heart of empire. A cyclone fence delimits the circumference of lungless labs. Police stand sentry guarding a road, check post, and gate. Or this line. The place where death is planned. Or this. Those who devise these weapons, decent, adjusted, family-minded folk, don't think they plan death. Their most recent bomb, which as an engaging joke they dubbed the cookie cutter, batters live cells, and yet, this is what matters, leaves buildings and machines intact. In the Golden Gate, there are moments of provincial globality that are about the mundanely beautiful. Diets of celery and bean curd. Cats who rule like Egyptian deities. Sunday mornings at Cafe Trist. Strangely San Franciscan things. But there is also the stunning provincial globality of places where death is planned. This is the globality of what Paul Virilio has called vectors, the vectors of modern weaponry, the vectors of televised war. Finally, let me submit to you that the Golden Gate forces us to consider the question of genre. Immersed as a studious post-colonial native in the imperial curriculum that is English literature, I had come to believe, growing up in Calcutta, that the formal meters of verse were familiar. They were tradition. They were my tradition. The Golden Gate, written in sonnet form using the iambic tetrameter, of course renders the familiar strange, using a traditional form, what Lawrence called archaic forms, to narrate the contemporary. There is much that has been written about the new formalism of the 1980s, of the sheer discipline of the novel in verse, of the intricate architecture of what Vikram Seth characterizes as feminine rhymes. That is beyond my can of expertise. What I do know is that reading The Golden Gate gave me permission. It gave me permission to render the English language itself a habitable text. What do I mean by that? Growing up in Calcutta, I attended what is known in India as an English medium school. English was the second language in my school, but we spoke our first language, Bengali, for only 40 minutes out of the six hour school day. And thus my mother came to ask me on a regular basis, what language do you dream in? And she was always very sad at my instant response, I dream in English. Even though she herself taught the Queen's English to brown-skinned Calcutans for much of her career. 
English. Of course I dreamt in English. I knew no other language. But what would I permit myself to write about in English? I had read the great English novels by writers of Indian origin, which were stories of India or stories of the Indian diaspora. The Golden Gate shocked me because it was no such thing. It was, in Gore Vidal's pithy phrase, the great California novel. It was permission. Permission to write about places and subjects to which I had been rendered alien. To write beyond heritage. To write beyond memory. In a way that perhaps Vikram said could not have anticipated, it was permission for me to enter unauthorized worlds. The world of the North American University, the world of Anglophone urban studies, the world of writing in English without an accent. It was permission to inhabit post-colonial modernity. It was also permission to define my own provincial globality. Thank you, Vikram. Um, in, um in thinking about and also, of course, reading and reflecting on Vikram Seth's work over several years now, and also in hearing Vikram Seth speak yesterday, uh, two things struck me with particular force. And I decided, as I was thinking about what to say today, that I would focus on these two points. Firstly, um, what strikes me in all of Vikram Seth's works, and also evident yesterday, was what I would call a, um, a relationship to form, to literary form, that is at once um, playful and also at the same time very exacting. And the second thing that strikes me about Vikram Seth's work as a whole is what I would call a, a supremely cosmopolitan uh, relationship to world culture. So what I want to talk about, and hopefully this is a, a good way to end the, the panel, uh, bringing together much of what has been said already, but except perhaps about music, about which I uh, don't know as much and certainly haven't heard the music of the rivered earth. So what I thought I would do is, is try and bring together these two questions that I think Vikram Seth's work as a whole so powerfully embodies, which is a, a relationship to form and a cosmopolitan relationship to culture. Um, now, in speaking about cosmopolitanism, uh, I want to suggest that we need to distinguish uh, uh, cosmopolitanism from two, two uh, things that it closely resembles, but which I think, with which I think it would ideally be contrasted. And the first is what we might call a globalized Western or American culture that is assimilated willingly or otherwise by the non-West. In other words, the iconic arrival of McDonald's in, say, New Delhi or Moscow. And the second thing I think that cosmopolitan should be distinguished from is a relationship to the foreign that can, can certainly be eclectic, but that is also in some ways commodified. That is to say, it's mediated in some ways by the market, and which can largely be reduced to patterns of lifestyle or consumption. Uh, we do this every time, of course, we eat out at an ethnic restaurant. Now, needless to say, the problem of cosmopolitanism is neither new nor the product of the globalizing West. Indeed, it is worth recalling, I think, that India itself has the longest continuous experience of dealing with diversity of any region or civilization in the world. So um, in thinking about the Indian case, though, I believe that this, um, it might be useful to think about two different kinds of cosmopolitanism that also, I think, function in contrast, but also occasionally in tandem. And these two, I would call, vernacular cosmopolitanism and transnational cosmopolitanism. Um, the, the vernacular cosmopolitan is one who is rooted in many ways in the local, while the transnational cosmopolitan serves a more diffuse or scattered global public. Now, to be sure, hybrid forms that combine elements of both kinds of cosmopolitanism do exist. Let us take, for example, the case, not so much of Vikram, though I want to come back to Vikram very shortly, of India's foremost 20th century painter, M. F. Hussain, who died only recently, in fact, um, last year. Uh, what is interesting about M. F. Hussain's uh, work is that he uh, indigenized the formal innovations of uh, European or Western modernism by assimilating them to popular Indian forms, from the film poster to popular religious iconography rooted in the local and profoundly open to the heterogeneity of Indian cultural forms, 
Hussein, a Muslim by birth, risked all by claiming a free and creative relationship to the Hindu tradition. Hussein ultimately fell victim to the religious obscurantism and political opportunism of the Indian right and was forced to live in a kind of quasi self-imposed exile, an extraordinary outcome for uh, a democracy where the arts are not in fact systematically censored. So I want to suggest that Hussein's case is one example of the enormous risks of what we might call vernacular cosmopolitanism, which frequently collides with the pressures of politics and above all with the contested space of the nation and of the religious imaginary. Hussein's exile, in fact, in Dubai, facilitated no doubt by the increasing prestige and value of his own painting as well as the, the, the market value of Indian art in the international art market as a whole, would seem to suggest that the transnational option is, if not always satisfactory, certainly safer. Uh, in the Indian case, I also want to suggest that trans transnational cosmopolitanism is obviously facilitated by something that Ananya spoke very personally and eloquently about, which is the widespread knowledge of the English language. An Anglophone trajectory, then, is the most obvious and the most widely chosen path for many writers in India, and their success is both a testament to their talent as well as to the global spread of English. Now, within and despite this Anglophone context, I want to suggest that what intrigues me about Vikram Seth the most, perhaps, is the profound originality of many of his artistic choices. Neither classical Chinese nor Western classical music is a part of the customary cultural baggage of the Indian artist or of the average middle class Indian citizen. Indeed, what I find particularly striking about Vikram Seth's work is, above all, his relationship to form and what I would call, and uh, um, Lawrence uh, borrowed but also changed the term I used in my conversation with him yesterday, but what I would call uh, Vikram Seth's choice of anachronistic forms. And please note, I do not say old-fashioned. I say I can anachronistic because it seems to me that anachronism can very often play a very productive role in literary renewal. So, for example, we see the revival of the 19th century uh, family novel adapted to the post-colonial Indian reality of a suitable boy, or the resurrection of the novel in verse and Pushkin's Anyagin stanza in The Golden Gate. So how do we understand these literary choices of genre, of meter, or of narrative voice? And what kind of cosmopolitanism do they bespeak? Now, uh, I have to say that I've always been excited and indeed tickled pink by the fact that Vikram Seth's relationship to poetry was so fundamentally shaped by his discovery of uh, Pushkin's Eugene and Yegin in Charles Johnston's translation. As a Russianist of Indian origin, uh, I share uh, much of his excitement. In fact, it was Pushkin and Russian poetry that first determined my own relationship to literature and specifically to lyric form or to poetic form. And so I want to just end by making a couple of uh, comments about the Sate Pushkin connection uh, and what it might say about both literary form and the problem of cultural uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, what's interesting about Pushkin's novel is that it emerges at the very beginning of the, the, the Russian 19th century and is generally seen in many ways as the historic culmination or completion of Russia's initial phase of linguistic modernization. Um, this, uh, this modernization involved the massive importation and productive collision of different kinds of literary styles from Byronic romance, for example, to this uh, French 19th century, uh, 18th century sentimentalist novel. So what, what makes Pushkin's novel such a fascinating paradox then is that its formal properties, including the Anyagin stanza, uh, highlight the imitative and cosmopolitan origins of literary culture as well as human behavior at large, while its historical role has been interpreted is inaugurating an authentically national path for Russian literature. Now, by contrast, Victim State's Golden Gate draws us to the very different context of a by now global Anglophone literary culture in which the Indian diaspora has played no small part. Although the novel's success is doubtless due to the convergence of Indian diasporic social mobility, first world editorial strategy, a recognizably American context, uh, the novel seems to resist easy classification, and this is something also that Ananya mentioned. Uh, it resists easy ca classification under the conventional rubrics of immigrant, Asian American, Indian, or post-colonial fiction. It is, a relentlessly, it is relentlessly and playfully local, an encyclopedia of the Bay Area, if you will, to, to misquote uh, uh, a Russian critic, Belinsky, uh, if you, uh, in which the Northern Californian good life functions as a kind of late capitalist equivalent to the patterns of luxury consumption that were typical of the early 19th century Russian gentry. Uh, 
And while Said's text is arguably as serenely cosmopolitan as Pushkin's, culturally equal to the transnational forms that it adopts, it nonetheless adopts a significantly different narrative strategy to Pushkin's. And this is where I really want to leave uh, uh, my, my, my comments. Uh, in the striking, and perhaps this is really the, the most evident distinction or difference between uh, the Golden Gate, Golden Gate and Eugene and Yigen, beyond the obvious distinction of historical location and context, is that the narrator of Eugene and Yegin is enormously intrusive. He is opinionated, he is self-conscious, and he is a structuring agent that both organizes but also delays the movement of the plot. Um, he is the protagonist's and the reader's compatriot, and he broadly shares their spatial and temporal coordinates. Um, by contrast, Vikram's narrator is largely absent, though not entirely. If you recall, Vikram quoted a passage yesterday, in fact, from the Golden Gate, in which he rather delightfully rhymes uh, Eugene Anyagin with Ronald Reagan, his uh, homage to Pushkin. But by and large, I would, I would nonetheless assert that uh, Vikram's narrator is largely, if not absent, then certainly unobtrusive. He does not constitute a, a kind of autonomous narrative plane. He doesn't have any kind of cultural marker. Um, in that sense, I want to suggest that the Golden Gate, perhaps to a greater extent than other texts by Vikram, though I leave this open to discussion, is marked by a kind of striking authorial self-effacement. Right? And I wonder if this might be, uh, what might be prompting this? Right? Is this the kind of narratological equivalent of cultural assimilation to the American dream? I doubt it because, of course, Vikram went back to India shortly thereafter. Right? Um, so what I want to suggest is that the Golden Gate achieves a kind of implied cultural fusion uh, through a rigorous formal objectification, which is the Anegan stanza uh, uh, in all its richness and cadences. And this kind of formal objectification, I would suggest, is a very different literary and ultimately cultural mo model to the kind of poetics of um, a writer very different from Vikram, also from India, for example, Salman Rushdie, for whom the kind of obtrusive and unreliable narrator is, is, is an essential means of establishing uh, not just linguistic play, but the very notion of cultural hybridity. Uh, so where does that leave us? What kind of cosmopolitanism does Vikram say to speak? Um, I want to simply open that question up for discussion, uh, but it seems to me to have something to do with the relationship between artistic will and the impersonality of form. Form is something that gives us room to play as long as we master the rules. Thank you. Well, my, my own preference would be to let you continue the conversation. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think you'd have flown me out for that, um, or purely for that. Um, yes, well, um, I, I must apologize to much of the audience because um, one of the texts that uh, uh, has been spoken about, uh, The River Nerd, uh, is this set of libretti which hasn't been uh, published here yet. Um, it was a set of four texts which were set to music um, um, by literary festivals. One was set in China, one was set in Europe, one was set in India. And the fourth one, um, which uh, Mary Ann Smart spoke of, uh, took the seven elements of these different cultures, the four European elements, earth, air, fire, water, the fifth Indian element, which is space, and the Chinese elements, which are fire, earth, water, metal, and wood. So these seven elements, metal, wood, space, earth, air, fire, water, formed this, uh, this the world um, um, of the seven elements. That just by way of preface, in case uh, um, you were somewhat bewildered by, by this reference to this text that, that, that you haven't read. So it's kind of fun hearing a disquisition on something that you, know, you, you don't understand. Um, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, first I'll give thanks to whatever God it was that stopped me from having a second glass of wine at lunch. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, because this took some heavy listening, I'm sure, but, you know, certainly for you and even for, for me, uh, to be analyzed before you're buried is something that's uh, um, quite a privilege, let's say. Um, I'll just take them, not anachronistically, but chronistically, let's say, um, in the order in which these, uh, these um, 
uh, comments, uh, some of them very generous comments, uh, were offered. So, um, Lawrence, first, uh, first, first, you're, you're having been in your firing line first, I'm going to return uh, the compliment. But I'll pro probably not look at you, otherwise it'll be very disconcerting for the audience. Um, so here we are. I have to make sense of my writing. Um, <laughs> Let it go on. Let it go. No, well, I mean, certainly, but uh, the idea of an equal music, very <laughs> sonorous and contained and calm belts. Um, there's a message here which says, mouth 10 inches from mic. Am I to take this seriously or can you hear me at the back? You can. You can't. You can. You can. That's fine. OK, well, um, drab folk dressed all in gray. Um, I, I, I suppose. The fact is, when you put a book out into the world, you don't really know what, um, what's going to happen to it. Uh, you certainly don't know uh, how it's going to be received, especially if it's a very weird book, uh, like uh, The Golden Gate, or a very long book, like uh, A Suitable Boy. Um, you don't know how it's going to enter people's private lives. Adanya very movingly uh, um, described how it uh, affected her. Um, and you certainly don't know how it's going to be analyzed and what things are going to be found in it that you didn't see in it yourself, uh, that might have been in it, but which you didn't see, um, and that weren't in it at all. Um, and uh, even though I have no particular authority or authority to uh, pronounce on, on this, there's some things that, that, uh, that, that bewildered and, and puzzled even me in, 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 in what, what uh, was, was uh, just adduced. Uh, um, some minutes ago. As far as Lawrence is concerned, let's see. The idea of um, um, you will not anthropologize, uh, anthrop 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 anthropologize, my friend. Yes, certainly. I don't think that I'm uh, anthropology fodder, or if I am anthropology fodder, I'd rather not know about it. Um, <laughs> however, um, he did mention that in one case he did, and I'm, 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 I've chosen not to ask him until later what, what particular circumstance that was, or maybe it'll emerge in discussion. Now, um, the question of archaic forms and inhabiting a form to be companioned in that form by the person who's used it before, but not to be haunted by that person's presence, I think is pretty much, in a sense, uh, the story of most art most literature, most music. Um, even those people who um, emphasize uh, their newness or their, their novelty, whether in a novel or not, um, are really informed by what's gone before, whether by reaction or by um, uh, imitation or by inspiration or any combination of these things. Um, Take the example of the Golden Gate, for example. Take the example of the Golden Gate, for example. Um, um, I wandered into a bookstore while doing my economics dissertation and happened to pick uh, Onyegin, uh, Eugene Onyegin in this wonderful translation by Charles Johnston off the shelves. Um, and my life was transfigured. I, uh, I couldn't think of anything else. I certainly couldn't think of Seven Chinese Villages, an economic and demographic <laughs> portrait. Um, the idea of becoming Dr. Sate no longer seemed very important to me. Um, how I would earn a living or justify it to uh, my parents, and as everyone knows, Indian parents are a kind, uh, a particular, uh, they, they need justification <laughs> if you want to go off the, off the, the well-trodden paths. Um, and um, I was just absolutely gripped. By it. Now, whether one believes in entities like the muse or uh, inspiration or whatever, or enthusiasm, the God within you, um, I know that it transfigured my life. But now, when you go further back and you look at the exact rhyme scheme, the structure, and so on that I borrowed from Pushkin, um, two questions come into play uh, one touched upon by Harsh and one by, by Marianne, I think, which is this um, How much of yourself is in the book? 
whether it's uh, through authorial effacement or through authorial tone or whatever. And the second is, what do you do with form? And how much of form is borrowed? Form spoken of in a very wide sense, um, not just in a strictly prosodic uh, um, context. Well, consider Pushkin himself. Where did he get this idea of writing a novel in verse from? Well, um, he pretty much admitted Byron's Don Juan was a huge influence on him. Um, now, where did Byron get his idea of, of writing a long narrative? And he wrote several, um, not only Don Juan, but uh, Beppo and uh, The Vision of Judgment. Where did he get the idea from, of the, this Ottawa Rima, this A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C thing? Well, from Tasso and from some of the Italian poets. And where did, it, it's a process of, 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 of quite a lot of regress, if not infinite. Um, so the question of form and the borrowing of forms is one thing. The other was the question of how much of yourself are you, do you in fact get taken over by the people whose, um, whose um, stanzaic forms you're writing in? Um, do you rent their rooms, their stanzas of verse, or do you basically move into them quickly, move out of them again, and stand on the open field and, um, and, and, and go into your own, own reveries? Um, I'll pause for a while. <laughs> Did you get my better side? Oh, okay. <laughs> the ball spot? Everything? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, what, what was that? Reveries. Oh, yeah. Out in the field or whatever. Um, so so I, I tried in... in um, when I was writing my novel of San Francisco in the 1980s, as opposed to um, St. Petersburg in the 1820s or whenever, um, to fill it not only with uh, what uh, was referred to uh, elliptically as Belinsky's comment about the encyclopedia of, of Russian or Bay Area life, but simply with the views, the feelings, the emotions, the, uh, uh, the circumstances, the concerns, for example, with the with with um, uh, lungless or Livermore labs and the anti-nuclear movement of my space and my time, there's no point in thinking about posterity. I mean, it's there, fine. But uh, if your book isn't readable by people in your own time, if it's seen as a sort of archaic pastiche of something that's gone before, well, then it's just failed of its purpose. Also, how much of yourself do you put into it as a very conscious speaking entity? Um, Harsh said that this was an act of signal self-effacement, that I very rarely came into the book. Um, but there were a couple of reasons for it. The first reason was that I really did want the story of my characters to be um, right in front of, the, uh, of my, my, my zone of consciousness. And I, 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 I'm, I'm not by nature hugely self-effacing. So, um, uh, but I didn't, you know, when I did have something to say, for example, about publishers or the lick-spittling critics, I sort of protected myself in advance. Um, um, maybe I should read it as, as a stanza or two of, of where I introduce myself in my own book. Also, there's a little Hitchcockian appearance in each of my books. Um, an anagram of my name, for example, there's this pathetic economist who stands at the sidelines and looks at you know, and doesn't participate in parties when everyone's having a good time, I keep thinking that an n-dimensional matrix could succinctly summarize society. His name is Kim Tarvesh, uh, <laughs> which is, there it is. That's, on the last page of uh, uh, A Suitable Boy, um, the married couple, and I won't tell you who she marries, uh, um, the married couple are offered a box of uh, mithai by Mrs. Rupa Mehra at the station. Um, and the, the shop from which the mithai comes is called Shiv Market. <laughs> Superb sweetmeats. Uh, and there's a lawyer called Keith Barnes uh, in an equal music. So there are these little bits of non self effacement you could call them, which enter the book. But Byron himself, but Pushkin himself, only has diversion or divigation for about 25 or 30 percent of his Eugene Onegin. Whereas Byron's Don Juan has about 70% digression and only 30% story. So you just decide what you want to do. In a sense, you could say, um, I had the precedent to be unprecedented 
uh, in the amount of, uh, of myself I put in. Um, my remarks would be all over the lot in a funny way, but I'll, I started out with Kern, but I seem to have gone <coughs> elsewhere. Um, as far as the archaic nature of forms, as I said, you know, Auden described the past as a kind of, kind of pattern book from which you could get your inspirations where you chose them. In much of Chinese poetry, um, they, they took a particular form of eight line, uh, an eight line form with five characters or seven characters per line, which was used even more standardly and over a longer period of time than the sonnet has been in the West, in, in, in Western Europe. Um, if you take musical examples, uh, you might, even in his own time, some people treated Bach as being rather uh, an archaic uh, composer, um, involved with uh, rather abstruse, um, uh, needlessly erudite uh, uh, canonic uh, 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 canon and, and, and fugue-based forms. Um, so I'm not too fussed about that. Basically, I, I write what I want to write, and then I, I just leave it uh, to, uh, to, uh, you know, to the reader or to the critic after me. I've done what I had to do. The other thing about examining too closely what you're doing uh, was rather succinctly uh, phrased by X.J. Kennedy, uh, a Californian writer, uh, in a quatrain he wrote. He called it Ars Poetica. Uh, after the, rather naughtily, he called it Ars Poetica after Horace's thing. He said. And this is something for, for writers, um, uh, or, and, and not just writers. Uh, the goose that laid the golden egg uh, died looking up its crotch to find out how its sphincter worked. Would you lay well? Don't watch. Um, and, and I think too much analysis. Part of the reason why I might be stuck in my present novel is because I'm thinking far too much about it, and not enough about the story and the characters and what I really should keep my eye on. To move from such elevated uh, realms of discourse to the mere soul, the voice, and the ethic of hospitality, I maybe that we leave that in the discussion part because it, I think, will kind of emerge from my other comments um, about how much of, 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 of a poet's hospitality I'm willing to accept in his forms, and at what point I wish to perhaps draw the line. Uh, um, Lawrence did mention that when my composer um, asked to um, to end the, the work with um, a poem by another poet, in fact George Herbert, than whom I admire no one uh, more, and whose forms I had been using, I simply said, no, Alec, you can't do that. Um, I don't think that makes any sense in the context of a work that's supposed to be a collaboration between you and me and where, however you interpret the last um, poem, however much of a, a dark or a hopeful uh, musical voice you want to give it, that's entirely up to you. But I don't want it to end with someone else's words. He, uh, what he did was he took the, the he had written a hymn uh, to one of uh, him tuned to one of Herbert's poems called The Flower, and he rather wordlessly, with simple ah sort of sounds um, and or orchestral and, and instrument, um, had that as the coda of the work. But he's having second thoughts about it as it happens, and he thinks that he doesn't really want to put it in, and whether the work ends on a very dark note, as in fact it does, with a poem called This about the nature of, I suppose, this could be implied uh, love. I suppose I was going through a hard time. Um, he thinks that that is the right way that it should perhaps end. Um, I, I don't want to double guess him on that, though, because uh, quite apart from the work being a poetic work, it then becomes, in effect, um, a musical work, which has a different, uh, which is a different thing altogether. I did always try to protect myself to this extent um, uh, when write, writing with a composer. Uh, that even if he wrote terrible music, uh, the poetry should stand on its own. Uh, so I didn't, didn't want um, my, my poems to not be readable in their own right. Um, but I did know with Alec that uh, I was uh, you know, in safe hands. Um, what I could not have guessed was that he would give, uh, produce works as, as wondrous as he happened to, to do from, from 
you know, by in a sense using or you could say trampolining of my, of, of my, my words. Um, so I don't think entirely that it's a, an act of generosity to enter the public space. Um, um, as, 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 as Marianne as, as Smart uh, suggested. I think there are different aspects of it. The first aspect is the fact that it's going to be a treat for me. Uh, that is, I am going to get a, a lot of pleasure from Alex's music. That's the first. Uh, the second is that um, writing is sometimes quite a, a solitary business. And it is occasionally nice to engage in collaboration, so to maybe cut the edge of, of creative uh, loneliness. Um, and I had a third point, if I could find um, Tetralogy, rather, uh, the London Bait Company. No. Uh, public Act. Oh, just, just, I can't forget the trout and the tetralogy. Okay, I'll leave, I'll leave that. It'll come, it might come back to me. Um, so, Marianne, the, the, the public act, the libretti, the festivals, uh, the fact that people are shooed away, for example, this, the story she's telling is, uh, comes uh, from a little bit of, um, um, of the introductory essay where I say, oh, this is very interesting because it, 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 it brings in the musical aspect of things. I'm interviewing uh, my, uh, my collaborator. Um, so we're talking about using, in a very serious context, we're talking about using wordplay and shape play. Uh, so I say, but wordplay and shape play, Alec, I'm not sure anyone will take us seriously if they find out how we amuse ourselves. Alec says, they can judge the poems and the music on their own merits. And I say, well, talking of punning, I'm very proud of that particular particularly puerile pun, which came to me out of the blue and which sums up our collaboration on the project. So Alex says, Seth wrote and wrote set. So I said, yes, that's the one. But to drift back to seriousness, here's a thought. A writer's book exists once it's written, and it's shared or received when it's read. I don't have to hear or see someone reading it for that to happen. And the process of reading is such a private one. I once came into a room where a friend of mine was reading one of my books, and he clicked his tongue impatiently and shooed me off. But the performance of music is different. It's a public act. And I don't know if a piece of music, or a play for that matter, could be said to be fully realized until it's been performed. I mention this because someone told me many years ago that she'd, be, she'd been at the dress rehearsal of Orion and the Dolphin that's the uh, uh, opera, and she saw you sitting by yourself in tears and asked you if everything was all right. And you'd said, yes, everything was all right. It was just that you'd never really believed that you would hear and see it actually performed. And that was why you were overcome. I can't imagine what it must be like to hear your own music for the first time. And Alec, after a pause, says, you know, people assume composers can hear their music in their heads. Well, even if that's true in the abstract, it is the performers who really embody it and bring it to life in a particular place at a particular time. And let us hear it with our real ears, not those of our minds. It's all the difference in the world. And the audience closes that circle. Their attentiveness, their reactions, even the direction of their gaze. When Songs in Time of War was performed in Wilton Church, someone said that a veteran from the Second World War had broken down as he'd listened to Moonlit Night. I was surprised at first, but they told me that he'd said it was exactly as it had been with him, separated as he'd been from his wife by the war. To know that your music has moved someone so deeply, what could be a greater reward? And um, with, with that comment by Alec, um, I'd just like to say that for me too, it was to know that your words can inspire music such as he produced and um, it, to me is a, is, 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 it was a huge reward. Um, um, and uh, the idea that I was giving something back to Salisbury which had been very hospitable to me or Joe, George Herbert whose stanzas I'd inhabited, if there was some sort of return generosity it was because I'd received so much uh, uh, in, in the first place. 
So to go to Salisbury and the, and the, and the river, do you think we could have that, that slide of uh, the river Derp to talk about the trout? Um, the, the cover of the book, perhaps? Or maybe not. Don't worry about it if you can't. Uh, you're working on it, <laughs> okay. Well, the uh, stream at the, um, at the foot of the house, yeah, <coughs> this here, is the, stream, is the stream that I talk about. Um, and um, the poem is uh, a short poem called Flash. And it's about this stream. And it's based on a poem by George Herbert, um, a sweet day, so cool, so clear, so bright, the bridal of the earth and sky. Uh, it goes on like that, but it's the same form. In the, the last stanza, he incorporates what's gone before. Bright bird whose swift blue wings gleam out as on the stream you dip and rise, you, as you scan for par and trout, flash past my eyes. Bright trout, who glints in fin and scale, whose whim is grubs, whose dream is flies, you, with one whisk of your quick tail, flick past my eyes. Bright stream, home to bright fish and birds, a gold glow as the gold sun dies, you too, too fast for these poor words, flow past my eyes. But such drab words are sad to say when all that's bright has fled and gone, praised by dull folk dressed all in grey, live on and on. So the trout. Well, this is a trout stream being uh, in, in, in Wiltshire, a um, uh, uh, chalk stream. Um, I um, think of the, this aspect of the trout, uh, the, the launisha forella, the very lively, um, Mercurial, I think, uh, was, was a good uh, adjective for it, um, which gives pleasure, uh, not just on the table, but uh, in its, uh, its living form. Um, I, um, I, I didn't realize that, 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 that there was a kind of nexus um, um, between some aspects of maybe my writing or my moods and the tribe itself, but I, I'm happy to take it on. And, uh, um, as far as the trout in um, the um, in uh, the uh, string quintet, sorry, not the string quintet, in the in the in the in the Forellen quintet, the uh, the piano quintet, um, um, in in regard to that, yes, there was definitely the idea that I would have to use it in a sense because I had to get. <laughs> Um, a piano, which is basically a percussion instrument and therefore is more amenable to someone who's losing their hearing playing it. Um, and, and you don't have to make your own pitch, your notes are given. Um, so yes, I did need it uh, structurally, so to speak. But in that same concert, since you're interested in questions of programming, in that same concert there was also a short patetzat, um, which is a string quartet piece, uh, and this was a string quartet. And then they were joined by a second cello for the great supreme work, I think, in some ways, uh, uh, of Schubert's instrumental music, uh, the uh, uh, string quartet, um, the great, sorry, string quintet uh, in C. Um, and that is a, a, as dark a work in many ways as the trout is as light and lively and lovely a work. So there was also a kind of, um, um, a way of inveigling um, the darker shadows of the um, Schubertian oeuvre into that particular thing, because what happened in the first half of the concert uh, dramatically was different from what happened in the, in the second half. Um, as far as the song from which um, the uh, Trout Quintet, um, uh, which the Trout Quintet uses a movement, um, that is an interesting song. I didn't, I didn't happen to know the third. The stanza of is it Schubert who writes it? I think it's a rather a bad, bad poet. Um, but I would say I mean Schubert also said some very good poets like Heine and uh, and, and Goethe and, and Schiller and so on. Um, but in this particular case, he he took a sow's ear and made a sixth verse out of it, um, a wonderful uh, um, um, song. Um, and yes, I mean there are hints of it. For example. Um, <coughs> Und ich mit Regenblüte sah die betrogene an. There's obviously the fact that he, with boiling, with boiling blood, sees the betrayed one. So clearly, there's obviously something going on other than just catching a fish. 
Um, so the, the idea of the Virgin, etc., um, uh, clearly, clearly uh, comes into it. Um, the tetralogy I won't touch upon too much. Um, I, I think the idea of a Gesamtkunstwerk, a, a, a complete uh, artwork which involves everything. Um, if I stumble into it, great. But I don't really want to go for it just because it's there as a, as a hugely ambitious thing uh, to do uh, in its own right. Um, so now, the London Bait Company and the Water Serpents, that I leave to, uh, to, to uh, I, I must say, that had eluded me entirely. Um, but I'm happy again to take that on board. Uh, um, damn it. Um, I got a lot of pleasure from that, that Bach uh, recital. I, it, it happened a long time ago, but I remember it as well. And I don't think we've met since then, have we? Yeah, um, 1993. But the, the Indian classical music and the Urdu poets, the tropes. Um, I do think I do use music as a as a as a maybe a symbol of something else, or, but I don't really want to lay it on too thick. It becomes once it becomes too obvious that uh, that's happening, then I think its efficacy uh, is, 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 is 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 cut. Um, Part of the reason why I, I wrote a suitable, sorry, an equal music in the first person was because I didn't want to make the music uh, seem to come from the outside. All this technical stuff that was being flung at the audience um, would have seemed more like program notes, I think, if it had been written in the authorial third person. So because it's uh, the passion of the second violinist of the string quartet, <laughs> uh, Michael Holmes himself, uh, when he goes off into, a, into some kind of musical rant or musical uh, effusion, then one doesn't really, you know, one just takes it as being part of his world, his universe. Uh, otherwise, it can seem rather learned. And a novel, you know, is not a dissertation. Um, and there's a great danger that, that it might begin to seem like one. And indeed, I have been accused once or twice of, of, of laying on the... the, the my research too thick. So, um, as far as the um, the the the, um, the crypto gay relationship or and music sort of being in the background, um, yes, I think so. I think it would be true of most, uh, as you say, this, uh, these affinities that the mu music um, indicates could be of any kind, really. Um, People say, you know, don't trust someone who doesn't like music or something, or, or, or can't hold a tune. In that case, perhaps I shouldn't trust my own mother, because uh, she, <laughs> I had to, to, to ask her when I was quite young, I think two years old, please don't sing me to sleep, my... Kali maashi aayegi, kali maashi ko gaane to. But I am not, let my aunt come, she can sing me to sleep. Um, but yes, I, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if someone likes music, and especially if they can, uh, as, 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 as sing music, and I see a very restless young man over here who who, uh, who sings it rather well. I feel an immediate affinity for for uh, for the person, not just for not just for the for the works that uh, that they uh, they um, um, they're singing. Um, but I'm not sure that this uh, carries across all my characters. For example, Ustad Majid Khan Sahib who uh, is a great classical Indian music singer, uh, doesn't particularly respect Saida by Firoza Abadi, who is the Ghazal singer. And he says, you know, music is it's like prayer. You can't use it as the cheap uh, entertainment of the brothel. You know, he deliberately does it down in that way. Um, trope. Trope, trout, trilogy. Um, trope for desire. Trope for desire, yeah. Well, it kind of is. I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, I think, the it's the ineffable, yeah. I, I, I think uh, someone said that writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Um, and uh, um, yes, I mean, what can one say? Uh, and yet, what can music not do, as Dryden, as Dryden said in his uh, Cecilia uh, Ode? Um, and at the, at the end of my book, uh, An Equal Music, I say I did not want to write this book. I did not want to write about music because I was afraid I'd lose, lose my love for it. Um, and um, um, I think it was 
enhanced in some way, but I'm not quite sure why it was, and uh, I, I hesitate to examine why it was. Um, Ananya, again, I, I really am rather speechless by what you said about how the Golden Gate uh, you know, affected you and, and freed you and such. And uh, I, um, I, I've never... Uh, cities are characters in my books. Brampur is a character. Brampur is an invented city, but it's an invented city based on real cities, whether Lucknow or Banaras or Allahabad or Kanpur or Agra or Patna. Um, and the other cities that come into it as well. And San Francisco is certainly uh, uh, almost a character in, uh, in, in this book. Um, oh, sorry, the wrong book. Uh, in, uh, in The Golden Gate. Um, there's a, a particular stanza where Where he looks, where Ed looks back at the uh, at at the city, it's it's dark. He drives. The street lamps shimmer through cooling air. The golden globes by city hall glow in the glimmer like sequins on black velvet robes of lights shines out across the water, across the bay, unruffled daughter of the Pacific. On the crests of hill and bridge, red light congests the sky with rubies. Briskly blinking planes, Venus bright traverse the sky. Ed drives on, hardly knowing why, across the tall spanned bridge. Unthinking, he parks and looks out past the strait, the deep flood of the Golden Gate. Subdued and silent, he surveys it, the loveliest city in the world. No veiling words suffice to praise it, but if you saw it as light-pearled, fog-fingered, pinnacled, I see it across the black tide, you'd, you'd agree it outvide the magic of your own. Even tonight, as Ed, alone, makes out marina, plaza, tower, fort point, presidio, he feels a benediction as it steals over his heart with its still power. He thinks, I'll phone Phil. No, instead, better to write him, as he said. And the story continues. It's just. The author interjects himself, but he can't avoid doing it. And it's a pity that I come here so rarely these uh, last few years. Um, but um, last night, as I looked out from my uh, hotel window, which is a lovely view of, uh, of the city, in fact, a better view than you can probably get from the city itself, um, I, uh, I felt some of its benediction sort of steal over my heart with its uh, still power. Um, not a good thing to quote yourself, but uh, there it is. Um, uh, the Indian diaspora um, and uh, the genre, the question of genre, um, uh, the use of archaic form. To some extent, I, I have touched upon that already through uh, through what's been uh, um, said. And to write whatever, to write about whatever one wants. That was the lesson that I learned very early on. Partly because I'd never studied English literature as a subject. I know we're not very far from the hallowed halls where it's taught, um, but, um, but uh, really it gave me the freedom to say, you know, I don't have to, if I'm inspired for my first novel to write about the world I've been living in for the last few years, I could have had Indian American characters, after all, uh, Silicon Valley is open to it, it's just that it didn't happen, and since Janet Hayakawa was the uh, based upon a Japanese American friend of mine, was the person I was imagining when I was thinking of Janet. Why on earth should I inject something simply because of, you know, either ethnic uh, responsibility or ethnic chic or anything like that? It's just clear. Well, then when I wrote a suitable boy, there were very few foreign characters, and uh, my American agent just said, you know, I think you should just put in <laughs> at least one or two, you know, a la the photographer Margaret Burke Wright in the movie Gandhi. Well, I thought it was a, really. I mean, if they're not there, then why should they be put in? Shoehorned in, so to speak. So I would just say, maybe it's just uh, my, the perversity or the willfulness of my nature, but I never really wanted to do what I didn't want to do. So um, and that applied as much to the forms I write in as to the, uh, the style of um, narrative. Uh, or to the, the kind of people, whether brown or black or white or yellow, who inhabit my books. Um, so, uh, so, so much for that. Uh, and uh, finally, Harsh. Um, uh, 
I did talk a fair amount about the narrative strategy and the amount of diversion I, I, I allowed myself. Um, as far as Western classical or Chinese music, it again follows from the fact that though I came to Western music rather late, I also grew to love it. And uh, though I've been trained in the Indian classical tradition, I saw no reason why I should restrict myself in my pleasures to that. As I said, when I began to write the book, I, I grew alarmed for fear of losing my love for it. Also, how does one write about music? But then I explained the strategies that I, I used. Um, the 19th century novel and the borrowing of forms that uh, were, in a sense, well trodden, but reused and recycled, but with, I hope, my own voice and my own view, um, or take, rather, perhaps, I should say, on the world I saw around me. Yes, it's true, but I also, funnily enough, uh, took as a sort of, not as a model, but as an inspirer, uh, the story of the stone, uh, which is, uh, or the dream of the red chamber, which is by uh, a Chinese uh, writer, a five-volume novel, uh, translated in the Penguin Classics, uh, um, uh, by the by a poet, uh, by, by a novelist, Tao Xue Qin. I think it's a 17th century, or is it 16th? No, 17th century, I think. Would it be 18? Anyway, it's, it's, it, pre it uh, preceded the great Victorian novels or the great Russian novels. Um, and in a sense, the, 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 the balance between private and public space was, was different. I, you know, different from what is it is, say, in Middle March or War and Peace. Um, and I would uh, suggest, actually, it's a good way of ending my uh, um, bit uh, of this. Um, um, Disquisition, almost it sounds like, though it's more a reaction, um, by recommending uh, to you, um, if you haven't read Eugene Onegin, the reason I'm sitting here today, the reason why I can take time off on a weekday to wander about the park <laughs> and not have an in tray and an out tray as an economist, is thanks to Pushkin. And every one of my books, subsequent to The Golden Gate, has had an Onegin stanza uh, at the beginning of it. I. Uh, and this, could you just pass me the fact book over there at the end? <laughs> Actually, pass me both of them. Or all three. Yeah. So the, the Onegin stanza is the most delightful stanza. And I won't go into the, the, the pro prosodic, uh, the, the, the structural nature of it. But when I wrote what I call the fat one, and which I haven't bothered to carry around with me, it's far too heavy, um, <laughs> is um, a stanza which thanks. Even the table of contents is in stanzas. It's it is. It's in couplets. Uh, it's uh, yeah. The last one, uh, which deals with chapter nineteen, says, "The curtain falls, the the players take their bow, and wander off the stage, at least for now." But it's been twenty years, and uh, it's only now that I'm getting to uh, to deal with some of them, or at least their their descendants. But the, the stanza that I'm looking for is ah, here we are. A word of thanks. To these I owe a debt past telling, my several muses, harsh and kind, my folks who stood my sulks and yelling and in the long run did not mind, dead legislators whose orations I filched to mix my own potations, indeed all those whose brains I've pressed, unmerciful because obsessed. My own dumb soul, which on a pittance survived to weave this fictive spell. And gentle reader, you as well, the fountainhead of all remittance. <laughs> Buy me before good sense insists. You'll strain your purse and sprain your wrists. Which can stand Maybe I should end with that. Yeah. Um, so um, let me, let me uh, either uh, ask you uh, guys, uh, or maybe open it to the floor afterwards, is there something that was really uh, germane to your questions which I didn't touch on or didn't answer? Because I'd really be happy to do that if, uh, or, or not. I mean, there must have been lots of things I left. Marianne, I don't think I did you justice, because you had three questions, and I think I answered like one and a quarter. No, I, if there was within yes, it's, ten inches. <laughs> if, if there were one thing that I would go back to, it would probably be that term Gesamtkunstwerk, which is which is an inconvenient term. It's it's 
suggestions are too grand and yeah. too Germanic and all of that. Um, but um, it's I wasn't bringing it up because um, because it seemed as if something that you were deliberately laying claim to um, in the River Earth at all, but simply because one of uh, the fallout of undertaking this kind of a project, or one, one of the results of it, seemed to be to rebalance the relationship between music and words um, in a way that I hadn't seen before. Um, it's certainly a way that has some um, antecedents in the 19th century, pre-Wagnerian, Schubertian. Um, but, uh, but I really I find that the balance and the kind of um, reciprocal infusion of music with with verbal meaning and the poetry with musical qualities um, to be really satisfying. And that last ingredient, obviously, if you're thinking about Wagner and actual Gesamtkunstwerk, the, the visual dimension is phantasmagoria and you know over overblown staging design. Um, but there's a visual element in your work as well, which I think is in the, the very different form it takes is, is quite illuminating. The, the calligraphy, the shape play on the page, um, with the, the homage to Herbert, yeah. and Easter Wings, those, those sorts of things. It's, it struck me as really possibly quite rich to think about the role that, that the visual plays in this triadic um, yeah. set, of, set of pieces, especially after hearing you talk about sculpture yesterday. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a slim book also, happily. Uh, I can't, can't write them. Um, yeah. Sure. Can I follow up on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Please yeah. do. Because I mean, everybody has been concentrating But on you might have to uh, get a mic, because there's some people there. Yeah. Um, a lot of people had asked you about form, but the question that Mary Ann's comment um, raises for me is one that I had been thinking about for a while, which is your interest not only in form, but in what I would call medium, right? And so sculpture absolutely does that, because there, all of a sudden, you are an artist working with a different medium. But then to reflect back on your other practice, um, one could think about um, the verse novel experiment as an attempt to remember that written words can perform you know, sonically as well as visually. Um, and that seems to be what is going on with your interest in verbal music, um, but also then, um, uh, what's it called, visual poetry, uh, you know, whether it's cal calligraphy or, or Herbert's stanzas. Uh, you know, so, so in both cases, you seem to be expanding the notion of language, that is, drawing our attention to the fact that language itself is multimedia, that it's visual, verbal, sonic, you know, et cetera. So I just wanted to ask for that. Yeah. No, it, is, it is interesting. And funny, funny enough, uh, with, with sculpture, for example, um, because I've I, you know, done other visual stuff, but sculpture came upon me very suddenly and, uh, and rather inconveniently. Um, but um, there again, the media within sculpture are so very different. There are additive media, I suppose, like, uh, like clay. Um, um, and then there's subtractive media where, like stone, you have to remove things. And if you remove too much, well, too bad. You've lost you know, the nose of you know, Michelangelo's David or something. Um, or, uh, or wood, again, you remove. And there are other things where you mold them. For example, like pewter, or you can <coughs> not just blow glass, but you can mold it, or, or bronze, or something like that. And there's something like plaster, where you can, you can remove, and then you can slap it on. In a way, you can't with clay. After it's dry, you can't do that. But with plaster, you can, and then you can cut, cut off a bit when it dries. So it's, it's, there are all kinds of analogies that one might wish to carry over from that to to writing or filmmaking or any of the other narratory, uh, if that's a word, media uh, um, as well. Um, but I did, uh, even when I was doing my sculpture, um, well, there's of course also letter carving, which is a, a, a very beautiful thing uh, in its own right, um, whether in wood or in stone. Um, so what I, what I actually did was I did seven animals. Uh, the first animal I did was a, 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 a wooden wombat in cedar wood. 
And then, because I wrote the word wombat, <laughs> what is that all about? Sorry, just later. Okay, later, <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's okay. Something, nothing to do with the wombat. No, the place is with the wombat. Okay, fine. <laughs> you might have to share it with us. The mic is going to you next. Um, the, the, the wombat, um, uh, each of the letters is, is very different. W, you know, you cut and carve in a certain way. Carving an O is very different indeed, especially carving it in wood, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so carving the word wombat was quite a, a task. And having done the wombat, I thought, well, all these letters are different. So that's interesting. So the next thing I decided to do was to actually make an animal which had five different letters. So what I eventually landed up was um, with a wombat in uh, wood, in cedar, a duck in stone, frogs in blown glass, a viper in pewter, um, a jinx, which is a, a, a Wenderhals or a Rynek, but J-Y-N-X, very useful for Scrabble, um, and uh, um, quail in plaster, rather than in aspic, and, um, and what is the last thing? I can't remember. Well, anyway, a jo, a Z-H-O in steel. A jo is a cross between a yak and a domestic cow. So these seven animals provided with, with all the letters of the alphabet, with only the letter R as a consonant repeated in viper and frogs, and a few extra vowels here and there. But then the pleasure, having created these very, very different animals in very, very different media, I then carved them in slate, the letters. I uh, made a kind of um, a, a, a letter carving in slate in, um, in minuscule, in, in, in lowercase. And then the same thing on a piece of Lancaster, Lancaster limestone in majuscule, in, in capital letters. So that, that's my way of getting words and shapes. Maybe that's my example of Kunstwerk. As long as we play a sort of percussion on the, on the frogs, <laughs> we can get the sound of music. I'm throwing one more thing, although <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll think that I'm over-reading you again. Yeah. Um, but lip reading yes. is a little bit like that, I think. Um, In a way. That yes. The visualization of the sound and the meaning. Um, True. There's another form that is quite a lot like that. If you think of Chinese calligraphy, for example, it, it doesn't have much color except for the red seal, but it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artwork in its own right. Okay? So you can read it as art. Then you can read it for its meaning, whether it's poetry by, by Schubert. Actually, could we have that up, um, the, the Chinese uh, calligraphy? And I'll, I'll sort of show you kind of what I, what I mean by it. Oh, great. So, um, as I was explaining yesterday, the, the, the publishers, because they thought the book was rather slim, wanted to, to fatten it up with a few other things, so they included calligraphy by me in different uh, languages. I wouldn't consider the English and the Hindi that I did calligraphy as just writing, but the Arabic and the Chinese are a trained tradition of calligraphy. Now, um, one thing that is interesting about Chinese calligraphy, if you look at it, Actually, I'll tell you what, I'll stand up and I'll speak loud. Um, Can you give him the wireless? Yeah, actually, give me the mic. Thanks. Um, yeah. So, um, on the printed page, this is black, but it should really be red. Feng Ho Lian San Hui Yue Jia Shu Di Wan. Jin. Um, so it's, it's written in a very cursive form, xing um, shu or running script, and it takes a, a little bit of of cao uh, shu as well. Uh, anyway, the first it beacon fires connect three, and you can see that's three, about the only one you can guess. Beacon fire connect three months or three moons even, literally. Um, home letter worth ten thousand gold. So the beacon fires have gone on for three months. In other words, it's a time of war. And the a letter from home is worth uh, a, a lot, you know, it would be worth a lot to me. So this is this poet writing in 760 or 758 or whatever, and missing home and not knowing uh, whether he'll ever see his family again. 
Prasari, I guess you couldn't hear. Um, and on the left is, uh, is, is, is the fact that I wrote it at that place, uh, the Chosherja, Autumn Waters Manor, and then the seal. Now, when I say you can read it, whether it's good or bad art, I'll, 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 I'll leave to anyone else, but whether you can, you can read it for its words and its meaning, you can read it um, as a piece of complete art, and I would dare say you can read it as music. Now, what do I mean by that? If you see a painting, you will never know whether the left eye was painted before the right eye, whether the palm tree was painted before the cedar tree, whether the rocks in the foreground were painted before you know, the civet cat, or what. But here, you will be able, not only chronistically or anachronistically, but diachronically, you can read through time exactly in what order the artist worked. You can actually, through time, uh, like as with music, you know that I put that dot first because there's a very strict order in which you have to, to, to do Chinese calligraphy. And say the fire radical on the left-hand side has to come before the fung aspect and you can read it and why did he stop there? Why did he re-dip his brush in ink? Uh, at what point does he allow the brush to run dry? Why did he connect the... You're, you, you're following the choices that the, that the calligrapher is making through time, which is something you don't normally get in a work of painting. So I would venture to suggest that there's a kind of aspect of Chinese calligraphy, maybe more so than sort of um, the calligraphy you do on an illustrated manuscript where you could do something before something else and revert to it. Here you might be trained for 15 years, but you've got to do it, you can't revise, it'll show on the paper because the bone and the muscle will separate out. Um, uh, because of the nature of Chinese poetry and Chinese ink. So that's an interesting aspect of, of, of something that's willy-nilly has aspects of an uh, exempt uh, uh, spec. And if I can just add there, what you're saying strikes me as being very musical in another way, uh, which is the way, for example, a violinist has to think of how many notes or how long a note can be taken out of one bow. Just like on the brush, how many characters or how big a character can you get with the ink that you've got on your brush? Absolutely. It's a, and, very, it's a very interesting idea. And the actual exploitation of the thin end of the bow where the sound will deliberately be different yes. or the drier end of the brush as the ink is, is waving out. Yeah, I think that's inspiring. Mm. inspiring thought, actually. Um. Can I suggest that when you put your Pizan construct together, that uh, you call it with that wonderful uh, phrase you came up with yesterday about an inconvenient obsession? It's a wonderful title. <laughs> Did I say that? Yeah. Yeah. I better write it down before someone else borrows it. <laughs> Could you write it down for me, then? <laughs> an inconvenient obsession. <laughs> yes. Well, I know I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm quite a lazy person. I'm a rather uh, indolent, perhaps. And uh, unless I'm obsessed, by something, I just can't do it. Um, that doesn't mean that every minute of it, you know, I, I, there's a fair amount of sort of, not hack work exactly, but sort of a stodgy uh, uh, tramping through things. But unless it's, it, it grabs me, I really, I really, really can't. So my life seems to be governed by these uh, obsessions. And the reason why that particular one was inconvenient was because I just agreed to write the, uh, A Suitable Girl. And here came the sculpture, most an inconvenient obsession. Good note, perhaps. Perhaps on the note of obsession, we should give you a rest unless there's another. There are a couple more questions. I'll just take those and then, 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 then leave it to that. Oh, sorry. I can return this because I Thank you for your comments. I, I have two very short questions. One um, has to do with uh, translation. Have you thought about uh, translating any of your works into Indian languages? Uh, and the second one is sort of a banal question, and that has to do with the state of the studies of the humanities in India. Uh, do you have a view on that, uh, and are you optimistic about the future of the study of the humanities? Um, I'll take your second uh, um, question first. Um, the, um, I, I'm not hugely optimistic. Um, but then, you know, I haven't gone into it in any great detail. I, I'll tell you why I'm, I'm, why I'm such a, why I made that remark. 
Um, there's something called the Murthy Classical Library of India, which uh, you might be familiar with. It hasn't yet uh, issued its first books, but, uh, um, but one of the things that uh, many people find is how difficult it is in India to find scholars of very high caliber um, who can do you know, really fine translations from the Indian classics. We have, you know, it's a pity. I mean, compared to what it was in the 50s or 60s or maybe even the 70s, um, I don't know why. It is. Maybe it's that uh, independent research is not. I, I, again, I, I haven't gone into the, the analysis of, of why that should be so. But I'm not really a student of the humanities myself. I'm just a practitioner. Um, so for something like um, the Center for the Humanities, though I, it's, it's most laudable. Um, endeavor. Um, I'm, I'm just one of the sort of, you know, funny way, beneficiary of it, or um, I, 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 I'm not, uh, in terms of my own studies, I was an economist, uh, you know, and uh, previously I was interested in, you know, physics and maths rather than the humanities. So um, I don't really know what's happened, but, but it really doesn't seem that uh, well, on the other hand, I suppose the institutes like IIT and so on, which now have tried to create institutes for the humanities, even in scientific institutes. So maybe all is not lost, and maybe you know, in due time, we'll find ourselves and our soul and our own literature. But uh, it seems to be a time of, let's say, tactfully flux uh, in that case. Um, the other thing that you asked about uh, the Indian languages in my translations, well, uh, the. Uh, it has been translated, uh, Suitable Boy, for example, and actually, I think it's called the Samanyas, Samanyas and Gita, uh, an equal music. But uh, a Suitable Boy was trans, trans, uh, translated, transplanted, um, in a very interesting way. Uh, there was a, a Bengali translation um, by Nakhi uh, Chatterjee called Shot Patro. Um, there's a a uh, Marathi one called Shubha Mangalam, I think, or something like that. There's a Hindi translation, uh, which actually I, I initiated even before I found a Hindi publisher, because I felt I wanted a Hindi translation. The publishers finally did take it over after it was translated, really, almost. Um, but they wanted to change, uh, they wanted the title to be uh, Ek Suyogya Var. <laughs> so I wasn't having that, and eventually we decided to call it which is what it should be, basically. Um, so that's, that, that's, what, that's what happened. So I'd love to have a translation of Urdu. In one case, it began, but didn't happen. Like it to be translated into Gujarati as well. Really, wherever the trouble spots, the communal trouble spots are, that's where I wanted to translate it, frankly. Um, and was, uh, yeah, sure. You for letting me um, extend things beyond the allotted time. Um, I still have one question on one bathroom here. But please, please okay. Um, I was um, struck by your response, um, a sort of ratification of um, Marianne's idea of, well, what problem did using the Trout Quintet solve? Um, ah, well, we can play the instrument. It also occurred to me as I've been listening to you talk so much about response, whether at any stage or at any time. Um, a choice of a piece of music, or indeed a choice of something else to borrow, ended up entailing a problem that you hadn't expected to face. Um, if having taken up a piece of music and somehow wanting to transmute some formal property into another medium, if some aspect of resistance was left over that you ended up sort of not quite having expected and then had to alter things differently as a result. But to some extent, I mean, in a sense, um, uh, say when uh, the quartet decides to play uh, as a quartet, the art of fugue, uh, they come across all sorts of problems. Um, for example, the fact that in one case the, the, the violinist has to be, become a, a second viola, in other cases where you have a note which which requires a score the tour, or, or you know, or sort of retuning of strings, stuff like that. So there are certain problems. And, and how do you tune, uh, say, a viola a fourth below its below its natural register? Uh, so then you you go to someone who actually makes violas and steams guts and you know involves himself in early music and so on. So there there are there were problems of that nature which came about as a result of my saying, oh well, why can't they play the art of fugue? And then finding out, well. 
for this reason, for that reason, and are they soluble or are they not soluble? So just as in a sense, a piece of music came in to solve one of my problems, as you uh, implied, having chosen, having taken a piece of music on board, it created problems, which then required, in turn, their own solution, whether satisfactory or not. Um, as for the transplantation of a work uh, of music into some other art form, and then deciding, well, look, actually, um, we've got an equal music, and there are eight parts of it. So is this, in fact, a double quartet uh, that I'm doing? Uh, you know, th the formal properties of the, of the prose itself. Um, there were parts, for example, where I found that I was writing an entire section of an equal music in monosyllables. Not just in my verse, but, but in, in just in prose. And then I carried it through. I continued in that form. I carried it through in the same way. Um, and the three sections in an equal music, which are entirely in monosyllables, as a result of that. But it was a self-imposed problem, not something that just came out of left field, in effect. Um, I think someone's trying to tell us something. <laughs> so really, the wombat and my peer to Pushkin, and that's it. So let's, well, what was it, Ralph? Uh, uh, I think I got punched. Yeah, I, I saw him getting punched. Uh, the moment I said the word wombat, but. It's because I'm known to be particularly fond of wombats, and we're an Australian family, so no wombats were involved, because uh, yeah. frequently in our home, but. Um, and also, a wombat for us is a person who sang the Miserere with Ian. Never mind. Uh, so there's but private jokes it, and there's no, a no, no. There, there's the, because you chose the wombat as your first absolutely uh, first animal. Uh, that is a very good choice because it is rather a blob. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yes, a very intelligent choice. Thank and I think you. Oh, uh, mirrored by him in the uh, that was his first thing that he did out of clay. Really? So there were yeah, really? a few wombats, many wombat connections in about a split second, and you no wouldn't let go. No wonder he punched you. Yes, and of course, you wouldn't let go. So no, I just like, <laughs> so my eye. Everybody this now knows. I'm filial and Indian sort of mother punchy behavior. <laughs> Surely I've caused it. Uh, yeah, yes, that's fine. I know, it's quite an right. affect, you know, affectionate punch. The wombat, I mean, I hear the case where obviously my bluff has been called. Part of the reason was, in fact, the wombat is a fairly easy thing to sculpt. But I can tell you, its legs gave me a lot of trouble. <laughs> and cedar wood is a very, very, unlike stone, you know, which is fairly consistent, usually. Cedar wood has areas, it's rather like swimming in a lake. You know, it's very cool, and suddenly you get a band of warm water, and then again it's cool again. Well, cedar wood, in certain parts of it, is very stringy and flaky. And so I can't tell you what trouble this wombat caused me. Um, but the wombat is a good animal. It is a, it is a, it is, it, it has, a, as you say, a sturdiness of character, a, a slowness of demeanor. It has a very, very soulful eyes. And I really did some fairly good eyes. At least one of them came out quite well. And, um, what was that famous thing about by Ogden Nash? But I would not engage the wombat in any form of mortal combat. That, again, is, is a lesson for our time. You said yesterday that you weren't reading. You said yesterday, you wouldn't answer what you were reading. No, not uh, Highly recommended, yes. The Diary of a Wombat. <laughs> is it ghost written by you or your son? Or? <laughs> the Diary of a Wombat. Highly recommended. Okay, well, I think this is a perfect moment to end because the Diary of a Wombat leads to another recommendation, which I shall end with, with a bow to Harsh and everyone else on the panel, which is, um, again in the Onyegin stanza, actually what I should do is read a, a couple of stanzas before it and then end with the pian to push it. Um, and this is something I read yesterday as well, partly. A week ago when I had finished writing the chapter you've just read, and with avidity undiminished was charting out the course ahead, an editor at a plush party, well-wined, provisioned, speechy, hearty, hosted by a long-lived Thomas Cook where my Tibetan travel book was honored, seized my arm. Dear fellow, what's your next work? A novel. Great, we hope that you, dear Mr. Sate, Actually, I think I must have been Indian. I, otherwise, that, that wouldn't make sense as a rhyme, right? <laughs> uh, great with Seth, no. And The Golden Gate by Vikram Seth. Yeah, a hidden rhyme. Uh, <laughs> we hope that you, dear Mr. Seth, in verse, I added, he turned yellow. How marvelously quaint, he said, and subsequently cut me dead. 
So then I tried to explain the stanza form and how do I justify the stanza, these feminine rhymes, my wrinkled muse, this whole passé extravaganza? How can I, careless of time, use the dusty bread molds of Onyegin in the brave bakery of Reagan? The loaves will surely fail to rise or else go stale before my eyes. The truth is, I can't justify it. But as no shroud of critical terms can save my corpse from boring worms, I may as well have fun and try it. If it works, good. And if not, well, a theory won't postpone its knell. Why, asked the friend, attempt tetrameter? Because it once was noble, yet capers before the proud pentameter, tyrant of English. I regret to see this marvelous swift me Marvel and Swift use the meter. To, to see this marvelous swift meter demean its heritage and peter into mere hudibrastic tricks, unapostolic knacks and nicks. But why take all this quite so badly? I would not, had I world and time, to wait for reason, rhythm, rhyme to reassert themselves. But sadly, the time is not remote when I will not be here to wait. That's why. Reader, enough of this apology. But spare me if I think it best, before I tether my monology, to stake a stanza to suggest you spend some unfilled day of leisure by that original spring of pleasure. Sweet watered, fluent, clear, light, blithe. This homage merely pays a tithe of what in joy and inspiration it gave me once and does not cease to give me. Pushkin's masterpiece in Johnston's luminous translation. Eugene Onyegin, like champagne, its effervescence stirs my brain. Thank you, Pushkin, and thank you all.